learned about mistakes, actually, because I went to see this wonderful old quilter in Los Angeles, an African-American woman who was amazing. And she was showing me her quilts. And of course, I had grown up being told that when you sew, everything has to be straight and everything has to match and the corners have to be perfect. And um, she made these quilts that the lines went everywhere and they weren't straight and they were like jazz and they were fabulous. And I was really, I was taking them in and looking at them. And I said something about making a mistake and she looked at me and she patted me and she said, honey, there is no mistake. There's just a little bit of you showing through. How did you go from the dinner party to Arts Reach? Well, after the dinner party, actually, um, I I think I had like four hundred dollars in the bank. <laughs> <laughs> a real artist. And, uh, <laughs> and this was 1978 and I had a probably a 1966 Volkswagen bug and um, no, no visible form of income. And so I just called everybody that I knew and said, I'm available. What you got? And I was hired actually uh, it, by two, two people. One is Susan Lowenberg over at LA theater works um, to go and do an artist in residence project in the women's prison, California Institution for Women in Frontera. And um, I also was hired by Judy Baca, who founded SPARC, Social and Public Art Resource Center. Who in herself Venice. is an incredible muralist. Yeah, yeah, I, I, amazing, amazing muralist, teacher, social advocate, uh, fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. So I landed, I, I wasn't paid much, but I landed well. <laughs> and, um, and I, the project in the prison was, I think we were there two or three years and we made a large uh, three-part quilt that was called When Prison is Home that's been exhibited. And with Judy Baca, I helped, um, I didn't paint, but I was the outreach coordinator for the last segment of the Great Wall that was that was painted. They have they'll, they'll start a new section now, and then I needed a job. I unfortunately was like forty years old and still driving a really old beat up VW and no through line for regular income. Um, so I just. I cried actually. And then I started applying for jobs. And the one that I was hired for was ArtsReach, uh, which is a nonprofit at UCLA that was dedicated to uh, bringing the arts to areas of the community where arts would not otherwise exist, which is a fabulous, just a fabulous mission. And it was a new organization then. Um, and so I began to just do what we knew, what, what I knew how to do, which was to create these artists in residency projects. Um, there was a lot of money then to do these projects in the prison system, in the California prison system. Artists in residence is a title actually um, that was set up by the California Arts Council. I think you can find these programs around the country they mean different things. But in California, it means that an artist is paid to be in a place of their choosing, which could be a school, could be an institution, could be a community center, um, uh, could be in a building in a neighborhood, and to be there as a fine artist, sharing your skills, either as a teacher or a project leader with people from that community that will come and work with you. Um, so it, it is just one of the most exciting ways to be embedded in where you want to be in a community setting, doing what you love to do. Um, and California is unique in the strength of its artists in residence programs. 
the fact that the California Arts Council was uh, had a dedicated program for it. And that one of their missions was to make sure that the arts programs existed in other of the state agencies. So they were interested in there being a fine arts program when they set up a state prison or they set up a mental hospital or, you know, something, which is amazing. Um, you know, if a prison is an institution for punishment, and there we were being creative. <laughs> it's just completely antithetical. But um, I always found it to be an absolutely fantastic way of using my skills in in service. So, uh, but Arts Reach, we were supposed to bring arts programs of all kinds, multidisciplinary, absolutely, to neighborhoods and institutions throughout Southern California. And we did. And we how did. did you find the artists for the program? In two ways, uh, really. Um, part of it was that we eventually got to be well known. So people would come and seek us out. Could I, you know, could I be part of the program? And sometimes we would advertise for them using an art journal or, or um, you know, putting it out through 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 net, through networks of 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 artists in particular disciplines. One of the first things we had to do was that we inherited the program with a contract to uh, do programs in about six prisons. The, the system was much smaller then. And actually one of the first things that we did was to diversify the program. So one, it was all kinds of artists, not just painters or ceramicists, but writers, dancers, poets, musicians, and then also it wasn't all white guys. So I did not know that you diversified the program. Um, yeah. what, what was that impetus in you to say, you know what, we need to expand how many artists and what kind of artists we bring to this group or, or this program rather? Well, I, I think it came from a couple of directions. I mean, we didn't make that up. We had a perfectly fabulous partner in Sacramento named Bill Cleveland, who was the head of the Arts and Corrections program in Sacramento then. And he began to push uh, for a diversified program. You know, back in those days, it was called affirmative action. But, but then it also made sense to us. And I was fortunate enough that we had the salary for uh, staff and we had uh, on the staff, we were really lucky. We had Sheila Scott Wilkinson and Nancy Baptist and then Darlene Harris. And we had Mary Lynn Hughes who had worked at Spark for such a long time. And there, all of us, it was our personal interest you know, to see that the programs were diversified. If you look at the prison, it, we we wanted people to, to match the populations that we were working with. And we knew, we knew um, that there is a phenomenal range of artists available, especially in Los Angeles. Um, and we just, it was hard because we were basically talking to paramilitary white guys <laughs> who were running the prisons, <laughs> you know. Um, and so it was my way of being bilingual that I could speak to what their goals were in order to achieve something diversified and creative and enlivened. And um out of that kind of mutual respect, because they could see part of what's so interesting and it's true everywhere, um, but that these arts programs existed because the state insisted that they existed. And then they suddenly had, were working with people, inmates, who were, there were lower rates of incidents People didn't come back. Things were constructive. Um, gang tension lessened. You know, there were there were all these good good byproducts. So out of that partnership, 
we began to get our way, which was was great. So the first theater group that you put together, was it for the prisons uh, specifically? The state wanted to do an additional program with the California Youth Authority, which is a state prison system for kids, unfortunately. And so uh, they came to us and they said, and the same up north with William James, and they said, we would like to start a program. And then they said, and the theater, the the facility where we want you to work wants a, wants a theater program. So start a theater program. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, and the reason they wanted a theater program, as it turns out, is that that particular facility had an old building on it that had an auditorium with a real stage and a real backstage. And I think that really what they thought they were going to get was a talent show, you know, <laughs> kids dancing. <laughs> But we did theater. <laughs> and for to do the theater, and this is just kind of out of, I, I think, you know, you should always sort of put a visual artist or a poet in charge of starting a theater program because we don't know anything. Um, but we started a improvisational company based in a lot of work of Viola Spolin that was interracial, multilingual, trained to work in teams of two or three. Um, it was men and women. And um, th that was like the best energy. And um, a lot of people will shy away from doing improvisational theater in a place where there are a lot of issues. But we found that that, that so expands the imagination for them. If you don't allow things to just dwell on the, the first draft which is all the issues mm -hmm. but that you really do genuinely create character you really genuinely create plot that you can you use every exercise at your disposal it is phenomenal um and we had some some just beautiful successes with it you also had professional um, actors working in it. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. no, no. That's what an artist in residency mm -hmm. is. You hire a professional, qualified, track record person, artist, actor to be there. Absolutely. I mean, I, I wasn't leading the theater company. I, I was just there completely enjoying it and signing the, signing the checks and signing the contracts. Um, but um, no, no, it was, we had professional people, wonderful people. Um, <clears throat> and one of, uh, uh, one of the things that I loved is that that theater company stayed intact for well over nine years, um, uh, which is very unusual in those circumstances because part of it is how much people loved the work I mean, the people that we had also, some of them had jobs teaching in college and they found that working in the community, we, we, we did theater programs also in Watts. We did them in um, East Los Angeles. Um, uh, and everyone always said that the participants that came voluntarily to these programs, these projects, were the, some of the most interesting and challenging students. You really absolutely have to do your best work because they're not going to let you get away with just phoning it in. It, no, it was they're great. not. No, they are not. I can, <laughs> I can attest As you to know. that. <laughs> uh, so a question that I have, because you took this job out of necessity to right. eat. You, as an artist, we also need to eat. Yeah, But what I find extraordinary is that you not only have an artist's perspective, but somehow you were able to um, bring um, a, a skill set of an administrator. Yeah. Where did you learn that? Or, or was that on-the-job training? Was that, you know, in order to keep this job, I need to know how to do this? How? Because right. now you're balancing different hats. Right. 
and I, I give a lot of credit actually to my friend Bill Cleveland, who was then the administrator for Arts and Corrections in Sacramento, who is also a musician and a fabulous storyteller. Um, because what I didn't know, I would call him up and he would give me on the job training. Um, very sympathetically, very supportively. That that was awesome. Um, but I think that the innate skill of balancing, I, as we know, not everybody likes everything, you know? Um, not everybody's cut out to be an administrator or a producer. Um, I learned a lot of it. Remember my grandmother, yes. my five foot two yes. grandmother? Um, when I was a tiny child and we lived in her house, um, she had a cast iron wood stove in the kitchen. And um, you came right into the kitchen from the back door. And my mother and I lived there. Her two sons lived there. A new daughter-in-law lived there. Um, and she stood at that stove and made really good food. And she knew where everybody was. And everybody showed up on time. And she kept her garden weeded and she made the clothes we needed. And I just somehow learned from her that multitasking, you know, um, how, how you do it, how you kind of love on people and you do it at the same, at the same time. It was that, um, and it was for me, especially in like arts reach where it was all about arts and creating art programs and it was the best job in the world because we got to make up what we wanted to do. And you were, all of you were also artists. So you were yes. doing administrative uh, yeah. uh, uh, stuff, but you all were artists. I mean, from Darlene to Sheila to Laura yeah. Lawson, Laura, all absolutely. of you were artists. All, everybody. Absolutely. Artists and actually re respected artists in our various communities as well, which was really nice. And I think part of that, so we kind of loved the work and we allowed ourselves to be artists. We allowed for that balance. And I remember actually uh, at least once a month, we used to take an art day and go out in Los Angeles and, as, as a group and see something and go someplace and eat lunch and enjoy the city. Um, but um, it really was about loving what we did and loving on the people that we that we did it with. Um, so, yeah, the administration wasn't business. It wasn't business as usual. It was we we knew what we had to get done. And we had to be so responsible. I mean, for hundreds of thousands of dollars of public money. And we had to do things on time. Um, but we loved what we did. So, And I think part of it is, and I thought about this also, is that we were working against the prejudice. First, that we were women. We were girls, you know, girls. <laughs> and secondly, <laughs> we, we were artists and artists aren't supposed to know about money. You know, artists aren't supposed to get things done on time. You know, artists are flaky. So we just made damn sure that that we did it right and we trained the artists to do it well as well. You were constantly breaking uh, the stereotypes. Yeah. Uh, on, on many, many levels. Yeah. It was breaking the yeah, which, stereotypes. Which is just, as you know, that's just so much fun after a while. <laughs> so we had talked about this um, before uh, um, at a, in another conversation, but you had questions that you would ask artists when you were interviewing them. Right. Uh, and I, I'm just curious as to what some of those questions were or some of the things that you uh, insisted artists have when they come to work for you. Yeah. Yeah. It was a very, I mean, having been an artist and been an artist who was freelance for decades, um, 
I knew how important it was to have a decent income, a regular income. And so it was extraordinary to me that, that we had the ability to write these contracts that were long-term and that people could begin to depend on some level of income that was gonna be really helpful. Um, but we also had an obligation because uh, our particular folks were going into a secure facility. We had an honorary obligation and bond to be responsible, to send in safe, reliable, trustworthy people because people's lives were at stake. Um, and um, so we just really had to make sure that we were going to hire people that um, were we could work with in a trustworthy way. And we had four questions. They were geared to the prison, but they were but they were like, um, what will you do when someone asks you what your name, what your full name is and where you live? And the answer to that is you don't tell them where you live. What will you do if they want you to carry something out for them because their mother needs it? You don't carry it out for them. Um, what do you do if a fight breaks out in front of you? You duck and yell for help. <laughs> Um, and I forgot what the other one was, but it, they were sort of like common sense questions. And it's interesting. We looked for everybody that came to us was highly qualified, totally, almost all of it was totally highly qualified. So we wanted people who communicated well um, because they were going to be teachers. They were going, we wanted people who would be trustworthy. We didn't want anybody who was going to go in that would either hide information or feel patronizing about working with the people who were going to be their participants. I remember somebody once said to me, oh, I absolutely want to go in there. I am going to be so good because I just feel so sorry for them. Okay. <laughs> we're out. <laughs> Um, excuse me, you're going to have to expect to learn way more from them than you're prepared to teach. Um, and I think sometimes people thought that it, and I think in some cases it's true, it works so much better if you can send in someone who's, quote, like them. So, for example, working with the Watts Prophets, who I love, um, Amdi Hamilton, and Richard Dado were strong people, um, uh, hip hop poets. Both had done time, you know, both men of color, um, lived in Watts. So the kids had tremendous respect and empathy for them. Absolutely, that's good. But also if you send in someone who is different or they've not had contact with before, you know, as a, a population, then you also begin to make change in that way. So, you know, we we sometimes looked for who was going to be a good fit and sometimes who was going to be a good contrast. I began to give myself assignments to go in and teach, particularly in the youth authority. Um, and I think we just talk about the fact that there were artists who ran Arts Reach and I think that was really important for why we were as successful as we were. Um, and if you look at success, meaning that th there were never any problems in the classrooms mm -hmm. that we had, nobody infringed on any of the regulations, we were respectful, but also the results were really high art results. Sometimes we taught and people would learn to paint or people would learn to write poetry. There are still programs that are, are turning out poetry that are just astonishing. Sometimes we would do a project, meaning that we would write a play or we would create a mural that was then taken out into the community or books were made for school children that were important. Um, so it was a balance, but I think that artists conceiving of the programs helped keep creativity at the heart 
of the program. We knew what it took for a place to be creative. We believed that every person is creative. It's a gift. It's a spark. It's a divine spark. It exists within all of us, some different than others. It goes in a particular direction. Um, I was so validated that in one time in working in the youth authority, um, and I, one of the places I was going is that what we started to do, because sometimes we would hire people that were like the constituents, participants who were going to be there, sometimes people who were really different, <laughs> like me. <laughs> um, and um, how that contributed. And then we began to, drawing from the theater company, which had worked in teams of two or three, we began to make teams of two or three, but they were different disciplines. You know, you and I worked together. My famous line being, I don't need no damn comedian. <laughs> <You> <laughs> and here we are 107 years later going, oh, yeah, I do. I need I need a comedian. Thank you. <laughs> well, I think I think it was uh, uh, just to uh, take a little sidebar here. Um, I had heard because I was I was uh, working with the men, the young men at Nellis and um, uh, Norwalk. Was it Norwalk? Nor yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, through Shelly Wood, and yeah. and then I heard there were women, at young women, and I was like, how come I wasn't invited to do the to uh, work with the women? Why right. you know? Which I love the men, by the way. I love those young men. Love, 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 love them. But I was like, I should be talking to these girls, and then. I was supposed to just be a guest artist, guest artist right. in your class for one day. And when I, when I walked out of there, I heard God speak to me. And, and yes. for those of you who don't know me, God talks to Thank me all God. the time. And he said, you're supposed to be here. And I turned to you. I said, oh, I'm supposed to be here. And you said, oh, hell no. <laughs> exactly. 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 <laughs> and I said, I okay. <laughs> right. Well, we'll try it one more week. <laughs> and I got in the car and I said, well, God, I, I told her what you said. I was supposed to be here. And she said, hell no. So I'm done. And he said, no. And this is what you're going to do. And this is what you're going to do. And this is what you're going to do. And then you called me back to say no. And I said, okay, but God said I'm supposed to do this, this, and this. And you said no. And you hung up the phone. And I said, okay, God, I did what you said. She said, no, I'm done. <laughs> and then you called back the following week and you said, when do you want to start? Start, right. <laughs> <laughs> that was an incredible two years. Because uh, yeah. I think you had, ex you had the class was uh, only for a few months and we ended up taking it for two years uh, with yeah. these young incarcerated teen moms. Yeah. And, and. I ended up doing a documentary, which I had never done before, but God said, you're going to do a documentary. And I said, okay. <laughs> right. And, right. and how it unfolded and just um, coming as an artist, coming in there every week to bring good medicine. Right. You know, to these young girls who were very ornery a lot of times and would, you know, they would try to get in your face to intimidate you. I always tell the story how I had one girl come uh, get in my face and say, I killed somebody. Uh, today's the anniversary of when I killed somebody. I said, well, you ain't killing nobody today, so sit your ass Just down. Just sit your ass down. <laughs> and, then, and then have another one say to me, I'm in here because I'm black, I'm a woman, and I'm a Muslim. And I turned to her, I said, no, you in here because you killed somebody. That's why you're here. <laughs> so it was it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. Um, very challenging. Also learning uh, as an artist um, not to uh, buy into their lies. Right. You know, because, oh, can you pick this up for me? Can you get me this? And then you find out it's contraband and, <laughs> and all the the stuff that, you know, your your um you learned so much and i just remember uh the first time working with you and you had given out scissors and then you you counted the scissors and i and 
I don't know why, but it, it stood with me because they were like little kid scissors. It wasn't even like they were grown-up scissors. They were kid scissors. And I'm like, yeah, and pencils. And you were like, and you counted the pencils. And then once being in there, I realized, oh, that, because these are weapons. These can be used as weapons. Even bubble gum is a contraband, <laughs> uh, or gum is a contraband in there. And then just learning how um, how creative the kids were oh, uh, in doing uh, uh, crazy things in the, in the prison. They, but, but they also were very creative so that you got to see them blossom. And, and what I learned, I think the biggest, two, two of the biggest things I took away was, first of all, 90% of those kids shouldn't have been there. Right. And they were there because they were creative and they had no outlet. And so what right. these programs did were, was allow them to see where their creativity was and, and right. it helped them blossom. Like some of the most incredible uh, art that they came up with, some of the, the, the writing, some of the uh, just just incredibly talented uh, uh, young people who did not have mentors or role models or anybody showing them the way of, you know, this, you, you don't have to do this. There's another way for you to, to, right. to go. And, and, and the other thing I want to say that I learned from you was one of my first times in the classroom with you, I heard you tell one of the, the girls there are no accidents because she said, oh, I made a mistake. I need, I need, whatever we were doing, she needed a, a fresh one because she made a mistake. And mm -hmm. you, you gave a, a, a teaching on no mistakes. I want to know how you discovered that in art, there are no mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I, I mean, I, uh, yes, I, absolutely. And, and, and certainly, uh, God kept sending you back because actually when I went back without you, the kids said, where's that other lady? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We're just not having this until we have that other lady. <laughs> like, oh, okay. Oh, okay. But I, it, it totally validates how working in cross disciplinary ways works. And we started, but um, in the stories, I mean, the, who these kids are and their stories and their, the world does not know their stories and they need to know their stories because these are people's children and, and, and just stuff has gotten in the way and it doesn't mean they haven't done bad stuff, but they're, they have a creative spark in them and their stories are incredibly important and they're being able to take hold of their own lives and then begin to make new decisions despite what they've been told. Incredibly important. Yes. Uh, I learned about mistakes. Um, yes. Yes. Oh, I, I just have to say that and I'll come back. Is it partly me and being in the classroom and actually um, it would happen so often is I give stuff out, particularly with the boys, particularly if I was one, the only girl in the room and the only white person in the room. I would turn around to get some supplies or something, and I would inevitably hear someone say to the other one, I'm not doing what that bitch told me to do. <laughs> and I would turn around and I would say, bitch, that's so interesting. Do you know what a bitch is? <laughs> oh, my God, what did she say? What did she say? <laughs> a bitch is a mother dog who will do anything for her puppies. She will fight to the death for her puppies. So isn't that a good thing? <laughs> Oh my God. And then you would be off talking about language. Miss Susan, I didn't mean that, Miss Susan. You know, I was just joking, Miss Susan. <laughs> yeah, and then, but then you say to them, oh, well, but do you know what fuck means? Oh my God, what have you done? Fuck actually means to plant seeds. It's an old term from farmers. Isn't that interesting how that comes down? When you put that in your, anyway. Um, I learned about mistakes, actually, because I went to see this wonderful old quilter in Los Angeles, an African-American woman who was amazing. And she was showing me her quilts. And of course, I had grown up 
being told that when you sew, everything has to be straight and everything has to match and the corners have to be perfect. And um, she made these quilts that the lines went everywhere and they weren't straight and they were like jazz and they were fabulous. And I was really, I was taking them in and looking at them and I said something about making a mistake. And she looked at me and she patted me and she said, honey, there is no mistake. There's just a little bit of you showing through. And I thought, oh, that is so good. And I learned it also in the studio at the dinner party when you'd be making a design or you were trying to create something and all of a sudden it would go wrong. And it wasn't anything like you thought it would look. And we learned more, so many times that it was something new trying to come through, you know, that it had pushed aside your automatic choices and with something new coming up and it, you really need to pay, you really need to pay attention to that. So, yeah. <laughs> what is something that um, you would share with a young person uh, uh, that you feel is really important as a collaborator? Mm. Yeah, I love collaboration. Actually, I, I, I love it. I love um, the brain trust that that is a good a good collaboration a collaboration that's based on respect so if if a if a young person is interested in collaborating i think i would say that they really also have to be sure of their own voice that that uh that when they enter the collaboration it's going to be equitable but to be able to listen to someone else maybe they're two artists of the same discipline. Maybe they're different. But to be able to listen to someone else and not be judgmental and hear what's going on, again, you then begin to make something that's bigger than you. You know, if somebody once said to me, you hold the tension of opposites. You hold this in this hand. This is, you know, water. This is lightning. And if you hold them quietly like this, then something, a third thing begins to show up because those two things together make something completely different. And that's what collaboration is. You are suddenly making something bigger than yourself and you're suddenly doing something that's much more about humanity and world story and it's more inclusive that way. But don't get, you know, the thing is not to be lost, not to fight, and not to not to, you know you don't you don't you don't lose your voice in a collaboration. So, Does that make sense? Uh, so how do you uh, uh, that? Yes, it makes total sense. Not losing your voice, but also not <laughs> dominating um, the other the other person. Because right. I think uh, going back to the water uh, lightning and the lightning, right? You, you need that right. balance in collaboration. You need that balance, right. and sometimes by you. Um, allowing the other person to uh, bring something to the table makes you a better artist. Right. 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 And and uh, yeah, because being collaborative is not being a boss. <laughs> you know, that's not that relationship. And I think I mean you can you can name any number of collaborations. We can see them in all kinds of places where people get teamed up. And they don't actually agree with each other on aesthetics or one doesn't have the level of experience that the other one does. So again, it's like water finding its own level. It's not to, uh, you, you continue to learn something from the other and then you make the result the best possible. You use the highest standard. So if somebody has, um, it, it, in the dinner party studio, uh, it wasn't exactly collaborative, although we all worked together and there were design teams and there was input all the time. But um, uh, it, it was Judy's work of art and it, it, what Judy said went. But as Judy used to say, the best idea wins. It doesn't matter who has the idea. It's the best idea in the service of what you're trying to say. Um, that wins. So, 
Um, I just I just find it absolutely amazing that uh, what collaboration can do, particularly when it's more than two people, because there will be people who, um, you know, where where I'm not particularly strong in some skill set, there's somebody else there that that's their strength. And so you are able to bring the best of everything to the to the work. In collaboration, it's also partnership. Yeah. And and with partnership, um, what do you see the foundation of partnership being for artists? Right. right. I, I mean, it, it, it's very interesting because to me, thinking about theater companies, there there there's collaboration there, but there's also structure um absolutely a visual artist agreeing to collaborate is something different most often you think visual artists are off working by themselves that's what they're supposed to do certainly photographers off working by themselves um but i think that collaboration is a practice that also is what happens when an artist is in residence and has a, a group of participants with them in the room you're all in there collaborating and it is based on respect it's based on your purpose in being there is creativity and being a good human being you know sort of allowing it's a neutral space so that uh you come through the door whether you're coming off the prison yard or you're coming out of your work environment you come there as yourself, not bringing all the baggage or the power that you have in that other place. It's being neutral, it's being respectful, it's listening, it's agreeing to cooperate and contribute. Um, it's being willing, it's actually being willing to be yourself. So again, no stupid question, no stupid idea. It's all in the service of getting something done. Um, and that, so it's sort of ego aside, spirit forward, creativity forward. Um, I think that collaboration also requires that you do your research. Um, what do you know about this particular thing that you're trying to do? What's its history? What's going on with it now? Um, who else has done stuff that we can learn from? also so that we don't do it for the hundredth time. Um, and um, it, it, so I, th and I think that also, again, speaking about artists in residence is in, tr in creating um, this equitable, non-hierarchical bond with the people that have come in as participants and they say, you know, the same is true. I love, I love the writer Bell Hooks. And this is how she talks about education, that teachers can't believe that they know the most in the room. Um, and they have to listen and ask questions as well. So you create this environment um, that uh, everyone is contributing in the best way possible. Part of what what happens in that is you learn where people can contribute and where they can't and things then in terms of life things shift i mean i've seen kids come into the room who are the biggest baddest kids you'd ever want to meet kind of scare them with jesus i'm really you're coming to my class oh good <laughs> you know um but they they can't speak well or they can't their logical process doesn't work or they stutter and then somebody in the class starts to help them and they would never have allowed that outside they would never have allowed that vulnerability but it changes something i've seen a kid who was honestly i mean just um so many things wrong and his body wasn't proportioned correctly. And the kids in this place made fun of him. He kind of got put in the class just to, I think, to get him out of the way. 
and we were doing a class with, I was doing drawing and Amdi Hamilton was doing poetry and Marcel Ajibi was a master African drummer was doing drumming. And it turned out that this kid could drum with Marcel. He could keep up with Marcel and drum right back. And nobody thought this kid could talk. And that changes the dynamic in the room because suddenly you see someone so differently and staff start to treat them differently and their peers start to treat them differently. And so, um, you know, those, those dynamics that we walk around in with the world and the privilege that we walk around with and the wounds that we walk around with, that all makes this, you, you get to put the worst of it aside and you make the best you know, it's yeah. just and, like the best soup this way. And um, I, I think when you're in, in a healthy collaboration, what happens is that you're willing, the willingness, yeah. right? You're open yeah. to, uh, yeah. it, it, it's godlike. I think, yeah. I think pure collaboration yeah. is godlike because you're flowing. It's not, well, what I want to do. And it allows, it, it going back to that young man who could drum, it allows their superpowers to emerge. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like his gift. Yes. His gift. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. I like to call no. it the superpower. <laughs> right. You absolutely yes. cannot walk into a collaboration thinking this is going to be a hundred feet long and yellow. Yes. And I'm going to talk to everybody until it's a hundred feet long and yellow. Because that's not a collaboration. As you said, no, it's it it's this. It's more like making gumbo. <laughs> yes, yes, and 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 being open, being open, remaining open. I think that that's probably the biggest tool uh, we have as artists is to right. be open, open. to and, the canvas, right? Yeah. So it's a blank canvas. Yeah. What are we doing? I don't know, but it will show up. <laughs> because it's it's true. I mean, any artist will tell you when they start to work with material, at a, no matter what it was you intended to make or what the material is, it can be fabric, it can be steel, it can be a, a play, is that at a certain point you get in the material and the material starts to tell you what to do. Um, and then it's out of your hands. So right. you, you have to you have to follow that spirit. Just Absolutely. like just like in acting, the character um, you you will pick up a script and the character the words inform the character. Right. It it creates the character comes out of those words. It's like oh right. that's the character. Why did I didn't realize that? But they come to life because you're willing to just be open and go, well, I'm not sure about this, but let's see what happens. Exactly. And it's, I think that that is the other way in saying it is you're willing to learn that you're willing to put aside this shield of like, we're supposed to be right all the time. We're supposed to make, you know, strong decisions. It, it, put that aside and say, I'm, I'm willing to play, you know, yes. it, which I think, it really is at the spirit of being creative. And I think there there are two schools, right? There are two schools of we, we know what we're going to do. We're going to do this piece of art. Everybody's got this uh, 11 by 12 piece of paper, and we all have red, blue, and green paint, and we're going to make a cat. But in the openness of, of your spirit and your creativity, everybody's not making that same cat right and everybody's taking those three colors and doing something completely different none of it negates the other one it's just right. your your authenticity is showing up and i right. think to me that is that really is healthy collaboration knowing that there's structure you know cuz sometimes in collaboration right. you have to have structure cuz you're you're being paid to come up with something within that structure. Right. Nobody can fail. Absolutely. You know, right. right. It's a safe place. Right. Yeah. That partnership and trusting the, the people that you're with, that um, you're going to, you're going to produce the best work, not because you're being, uh, you're being a perfectionist, but because you're being open. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, uh, uh, there's a Lakota prayer that I love, which is when there's an issue, there's a mystery, 
the prayer is, may this unfold in the best way, meaning also that you turn it over to God. You as a human being are not determining the outcome here. This may this unfold in the best way. And I, I think that's so applicable to what you're speaking about in that way of collaborating. Yeah. 